The most mysterious thing about creativity is how it starts. The moment of inspiration. That first seed of possibility that launches you head first into a work of art or a novel or a passion project until you see it through. And it's that moment which actually gives creativity that magical quality, a feeling that artists have been trying to describe for centuries. And people have been struggling to understand it. We've only been able to represent it partially, symbolically. You've probably seen that famous symbol of a cartoon light bulb appearing over someone's head, lighting up as they have their eureka moment. And in history, we find countless examples of artists trying to make sense of where their inspiration comes from. Some say you receive visions from divine sources, or you commune with the muses, or even in more modern interpretations. Psychology says we receive projections from our unconscious mind. Things is bubbling up from some kind of primordial cauldron behind the curtain of consciousness. On that note, we've all felt that stinging discomfort of writer's block, that moment when you feel unmotivated or annoyed with the creative process because it's acting like an untamed animal hiding off in a corner somewhere in your mind while you toil away frustrated, saying to yourself, like, this worked last week, why isn't it working this week? How can we avoid that? Is there a way to guarantee inspiration? To guarantee that our creative pursuits will flow full of ideas and insights? I believe there is. I know there is. I've been studying about creativity since I was a teenager. And throughout that time, I've even kept personal journals about my own creative process for future reference so that I could be more aware of what I did right and what I did wrong. And I really recommend that, actually. It's been just the most insightful thing. You get to learn what didn't work and what you could improve upon. Now, for full disclosure, I'm 33 years old now. And I can confidently say that because of how much I've paid attention throughout the years and also through just reading about it, studying it, and asking other people who are creative artists who I respect about their processes, I'm really starting to see the creative process more clearly than I ever have before. And I want to share that with you. I want to share all I've learned so that your process your creativity is flowing with more inspiration, more moments of ideas and insights. And that's what we're diving into today. Inspiration. Welcome to Creative Codex. I am your host, MJ Dorian. Today, we're going to be tackling inspiration, what it is, how it works, and how to get more of it. I've recently been obsessed with Leonardo da Vinci, one of history's most celebrated creative geniuses. When you usually hear people talk about Leonardo, they are usually talking about his paintings. And he was, without a doubt, one of the greatest painters to ever live. But what truly makes him a mammoth of creative genius is that painting wasn't the only thing he did. He was active in so many different mediums that he made painting look like a side hobby. His creative output ranges from masterful illustrations to paintings to engineering to philosophy to even set design for theater productions. When you hear Leonardo da Vinci, you don't really think set design as your first inclination. But that's actually how he made um, his steady money. He was a set designer for the courts of the Medici family and these very rich, wealthy court families. Now, Leonardo lived during the late 1400s in Italy during the era of Renaissance art. And while I've been reading his biography and exploring his notebooks... 
I became fixated on this question: What makes Leonardo different than normal people? The problem gnawed at me for days, and the answers didn't quite fit. Sure, he was an illegitimate son. Sure, he wrote with his left hand during a time when that was taboo. He was gay during a time when that was a punishable offense. He was a vegetarian.、Um, I don't think that was punishable, but <laughs> it's it's worth mentioning because it's pretty unique. Now these are surface details, though, and they make him more intriguing to us. It makes him more human, but it doesn't answer the question at hand: What was his brain doing differently? And maybe what can we learn? How can we learn to do the same? How could he be so consistently inspired and brilliant that we are here now in 2018 still talking about him? Well, let's find out from the man himself. Let's take a walk through the streets of Florence in the late 1400s and make our way to Leonardo's personal art studio. It's on these streets of Florence, Italy, in the late 1400s, that Leonardo grew up, and it's in this city that he started some of his most famous paintings. Part of the secret to his genius is Florence itself. He was not a hermit off on some mountainside, separate from society and culture. He was a man of his time, and he was constantly surrounded by the beauty and elegance of this fabled city. At a rare time when Florence was considered by many to be the capital of the world, unsurpassed in cultural riches, you can hear the distant church bells of Florence's many towering cathedrals. The air is refreshing and brisk in the afternoon sun, as many of these side streets hide in the shade. And you can smell the aroma of fresh baked bread and cured meats from local shops. Oh, what's this? Let's stop for a moment. What's that? There's a merchant. She's set up shop here across the street. She's selling fresh bread and cheese. Buongiorno. And pet birds, which are quite popular here. There are anecdotes, actually, about Leonardo that one of his favorite things was to watch birds fly. So he would often buy a bird from one of these merchants. Take it out of its cage and release it, watching intently as it fluttered away. This merchant's also selling a brand new kind of distraction that is sweeping the country: books. She has a stack of newly printed books, and it was in 1440 that the Gutenberg press was actually invented, and it revolutionized the way people learn and entertain themselves. Leonardo was an avid reader. He saw reading as a way to educate himself about art, science, philosophy, and he never received a formal education. Partially because he was an illegitimate son, and partially because he actually detested school. But what he lacked in formal education, well, we know he more than made up for in his personal studies and inquisitive research. What's that? You hear it? It's a distant violin.、Huh, it must be a street musician.
grazie And the entrance to Leonardo's studio is right through that gate and up the stairs. The studio is actually part of a convent here called Santissima Annunziata. Right this way. Master's workshop. If only Leonardo was here, we could ask him our questions. Imagine that. But he must be out at this time. I'm sure he won't mind if we look around a little bit. What's that? It's one of the paintings he's currently working on, but it's covered with a tarp. Probably to protect it. I wonder, is it an unfinished Mona Lisa, which we know he actually started around this area of the country in Florence? Apparently, the woman who the Mona Lisa is based after was a frequent parishioner here, and it's possible he would have run into her near the convent. Or maybe it's one of the other ones, the lady with the ermine. And here we see a pile of books. Ah, Leonardo the avid reader, Leonardo the bookworm, but it's positioned near his easel. Often, as Leonardo would be working on a painting, one of his assistants would open up a book and begin reading. It was a way of keeping him entertained and engaged and learning while he was doing something else. It's actually very much like a podcast. Perhaps he invented those too. And what's that? A section in the far left corner with drapery to block off the line of sight, as if uh, for privacy, from prying eyes. There is a long wooden table, six feet long by three feet wide. Some sullied blankets lay nearby in a wicker basket. Huh. This must be where Leonardo did his most forbidden work, the dissection of corpses. Bodies that were loaned to him for documentation by hospitals. The church considered this kind of work highly disgraceful, so Leonardo knew to keep it hidden. And here it is. Leonardo wanted to see behind the skin, to understand the muscles, the sinew, and the bones of the human body. He believed there was a connection between our emotions and how they transmitted motion in our muscles, in our posture, in a pose that we might hold for a moment as we're speaking. And he was a student of Alberti, who was famous for writing an essential treatise on painting, in which Alberti states that a true artist builds their human subjects from the bones, then the muscles, then the naked figure, and finally the clothes. And this gives a truly lifelike demeanor to the body and to the subject of your painting. Now what's especially impressive about the fact that Leonardo did these kind of dissections is that this was before the time of um, a proper way to treat the bodies and preserve them. So they weren't exactly pleasant to be around. And in one of Leonardo's famous notebook entries he goes on to say, you will perhaps be deterred by your stomach, and if this does not deter you, you may be deterred by the fear of living through the night hours in the company of quartered and flayed corpses fearful to behold. And if this does not deter you, perhaps you will lack the good draftsmanship that such a depiction requires. And even if you have skill in drawing, it may not be accompanied by a knowledge of perspective. 
and if it were so accompanied, you may lack the methods of geometrical demonstration and of calculating the forces and strengths of the muscles, or perhaps you will lack patience so that you will not be diligent." Unquote. I think Leonardo was a bit proud of the fact that he was able to do these kinds of studies, and maybe he knew artists who had tried them and were not able to stomach it. And perhaps that's what he means with the tone he takes in that entry. Now, standing here in the master's studio, let's revisit our first question. What made Leonardo so different? What was his brain doing that was so exceptional that we still talk about him? That he was raised to a timeless level of creative genius that serves us like a model for all artists to come? Well, it turns out the answer is right there in his notebooks. And it's been there. And all it took was for researchers and art historians to start flipping through them and asking what is he doing in these notebooks. So it turns out his personal journals is where you can see him sketching the muscles of a human hand or laying out precise geometry, studying the swirling patterns of water and really anything and everything that caught his eye. It's in these notebooks that we not only find the passing daydreams of an eccentric thinker. No, here we find a window into Leonardo's brilliant mind. The biographer Walter Isaacson says that Leonardo's notebooks are the greatest record of curiosity ever created. End quote. Now, I imagine that to have Leonardo's eye is to be able to see infinite wonder in everything, infinite detail to every person, object, animal, and tree. If he looked at your face, I imagine he wouldn't just see what we all see. He would notice how the sunlight causes your cheek to glow and creates a dark shadow under your brow. He'd know that the muscles behind your skin move in synchronicity to express the emotions of your conversation. He studied anatomy like a scientist, and it seems he saw infinite detail in everything. It is much like the poet William Blake said, to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. And you can see the world that way, if you choose. It's not a thing of some romantic era past. Oftentimes, the more you look at something and start even asking simple questions about it, then truly the more you become fascinated by it. There is as much wonder and detail in everything you see, hear, smell, taste, and touch that you choose to engage in whether it's listening to the sounds in a park or detecting the aromas on a street. Infinite detail. And so it is possible to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower. So as I began to see the way Leonardo viewed the world, the question of what made him different was given an answer. Curiosity. And within that word is hidden the answer to our question. What drives inspiration? Curiosity. And then a phrase arose in my mind from the depths of my thoughts. In curiosity hides inspiration. In curiosity hides inspiration. What does this mean? Well, you can't expect to receive any moment of inspiration or insight if you aren't feeding your head new and interesting things. In the process of feeding your head, you are opening the gates. Those influences then sink into the dark, ancient pools of your unconscious mind, as psychology has so beautifully described to us, and then you consciously make your intention clear. You become genuinely intrigued or obsessed with finding the solution to a certain problem or a new creative project. 
and the energy of that obsession is actually your will. And you are bringing your will into the equation. And that is when the magic happens. That is all your unconscious needs. The material of curiosity, the impetus for a direction which is provided by your will, and voila. It churns the contents into a deep cauldron and brings them forth in the form of inspiration. Now, sometimes that moment of insight comes in the oddest way. While taking a walk, for example, uh, the composer Beethoven, when you read his biographies, uh, he was notorious for taking long walks in the park near his home. And he credited many of his inspirations to insights that came to him during those walks. Other times, the inspiration may come while you are actually working on the project. I remember a dozen times when I was laying out the structure of an illustration, first in pencil before applying any ink to it, and something just didn't seem right. And as I took a step back, erased, and tried again and measured, something hit me. Some element having to do with the proportion of the body or the strange feeling that something was missing from the original plan. And by figuring out maybe adding a lamp, an ornate lamp in one illustration or a specific angle to a tree in another illustration, and just things lined up and they were perfect. It's almost like my conscious mind felt a pressure or something from behind itself that was saying, is something still not right? And it's almost like behind the curtain, there's these neurons, these neural pathways that have arranged themselves into an answer already, which is really bizarre. They've arranged themselves into a structure that has the answer, but consciously, we can't access it. We knock on that door and we try. And sometimes the inspiration kind of just slips through when you're not paying attention. Um, sometimes it's when you're active physically in another task. And other times, it's a kind of a trial and error. And you try this and you, you know what doesn't work. You may not know what's going to work. But by trying things, you know, throwing things at the board, little by little, you feel you're getting closer to what the answer is. And if we could only just push that curtain aside, the answer would be staring us in the face. What's fascinating is that the mystery of creativity and the process makes it like this, that it's not clear. And there's always a journey you have to take to find it. And in other cases, some people receive their inspiration in the shower. Many singers love the shower for that reason. And the warm mistiness of a hot shower really warms up the vocal cords. Some writers swear that they get inspiration on the toilet. And I'm not ashamed to admit that both types of inspiration, shower inspiration and toilet inspiration, have also happened to me. Moving on, Salvador Dali swore that many of his inspirations came from vivid dreams, or the moment immediately after waking up from a nap. So, the unconscious mind can be unpredictable in how it delivers your moment of inspiration. But what we can predict is that there is no inspiration if you have not started the wheels in motion with curiosity. Now, let me share with you one of my favorite entries in Leonardo da Vinci's personal journal. He writes about a particular hike near Florence. It begins, Having wandered some distance among gloomy rocks, I came to the mouth of a great cavern, in front of which I stood some time, astonished. Bending back and forth, I tried to see whether I could discover anything inside. But the darkness within prevented that. Suddenly, there arose in me two contrary emotions, fear and desire, fear of the threatening dark cave and desire to see whether there was any marvelous thing within. Did Leonardo enter? Would he risk the possibility of perhaps disturbing a bear that might be inside? Was his curiosity so strong that he would risk entering the unknown and plummeting down a ravine? 
he did enter. And inside he found something marvelous embedded in a wall, the fossil of a whale. He goes on. O oh, mighty and once living instrument of nature, your vast strength was to no avail. You lashed with swift, branching fins and forked tail, creating in the sea sudden tempests that buffeted and submerged ships. O oh, time, swift despoiler of all things, how many kings, how many nations hast thou undone? And how many changes of states and of circumstances have happened since this wondrous fish perished? Now this encounter with the fossil whale is convincing proof of Leonardo's insatiable curiosity. The fact he had this inclination to risk all sense and reason in the pursuit of discovery, very much like the curiosity of a child. A rare and refreshing thing to see in a grown man. Which brings us back to what I stated earlier. In curiosity hides inspiration. Whether Leonardo knew it or not, he kept reigniting the fuel. He kept turning the wheels of that engine again and again, which allowed him to receive wave after wave of insights, day to day, week to week, throughout his entire lifetime. Because he retained a certain curiosity that is akin to how a child sees the world. In curiosity hides inspiration. I'm going to end this episode with a final insight that I've learned that didn't exactly fit into the story and so I'm putting it at the end. Here goes. Inspiration can begin as a pressure in the head, a subtle but persistent nagging which tries to nudge you along a certain path of inquiry. From that stage of inspiration, the process continues in one of three paths. A. You choose to ignore it, and so without encouragement, the new thought disappears forever. B. You choose to ignore it, the nagging feeling retreats, but beckons forth again another time or day. Or C. You follow the call. You pursue the feeling with curiosity. You wander down the hallway to see where it leads. From all three choices, I encourage you always choose the third. Always respond to the call, that little nagging feeling. Always open the door and see where it leads, even if the result is not fruitful. Choose to follow your curiosity. For this reason, it reinforces the first step of the inspiration process. If you listen to what your brain is trying to ask of you, then it will encourage the process to occur again later on. You are strengthening the neural network that gives birth to your moments of insight. Think of it like encouraging a child. Research shows it is very easy to discourage a child from asking questions. And it turns out the parent doesn't even have to reprimand the child for asking. In studies where children asked parents how something worked, or what the definition of a word was, and the parent ignored the child or said, I don't know, it had a negative impact on the child's likelihood to ask the parent again the next time they had a question. All the parent has to do is ignore the child when they have a curious insight. And the child will simply stop being curious. Or will stop sharing their moments of insight or their moments of curiosity. It is the same functional process at work here. The more you entertain the whim of your curiosity toward a hunch or gut feeling or slight pressure in your mind to inquire about something, then the more you strengthen your insights the more you strengthen your insight process. So always follow the third path. Respond to the call. That's it. Thank you for listening.
This has been Creative Codex, our second episode. I really learned so much in preparing for this one, especially reading about the Renaissance. Um, it's one of my favorite periods in art history and about one of my favorite artists, Leonardo da Vinci. If you're looking to learn more about him, I highly suggest the book that gave me a lot of my ideas and my inspirations on this one. Um, it's the biography of him, written by the author Walter Isaacson. Um, it's chock full of anecdotes and selected portions of Leonardo's own journals that you can check out. Highly recommend it. It also gives you a sense of how the world was like in the late 1400s, if you're into that. Now, with each episode of the podcast, I'm trying to focus on a different aspect of creativity. The first episode was about how creativity and art started and what the original purpose may have been. The second episode was about the secret of inspiration, which is curiosity. As we established, in curiosity hides inspiration. Now, I have to ask a favor of you. If you are enjoying this podcast so far and you want to see more episodes in the near future, there is something you can do which will help me tremendously. Please share this episode with someone you think could enjoy it. You can simply copy the link from your podcast listening app or site or however you're hearing it and email it to that person or text them. It's a small step. It's a simple step, but it will help grow our audience so we can keep this train rolling and dig deeper into creativity. Thank you in advance for that. Also, pretty soon, I'll be starting conversation portions of the podcast where I'll be speaking with creative people in various fields about their process and their experience. And I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's going to be really insightful to hear how different people experience the creative process. So it seems like each episode takes about uh, roughly two weeks to produce. I focus a lot on the music and sound design choices. I really want to create these soundscapes that create a unique experience that you won't find anywhere else. So please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Even if you don't listen to it on iTunes, it will help the show get recognized. Oh, uh, if you'd like to see some images of the cool stuff I discussed in this episode, like Leonardo's notebooks, which are deeply fascinating, please visit the Creative Codex website, mjdorian.com forward slash codex. That's m-j-d-o-r-i-a-n dot com forward slash c-o-d-e-x. Until next time, stay curious be inspired. Arrivederci.